For a short moment, it looked like Vladimir Putin and his Russian empire were beginning to falter. Triggered not by the current Ukrainian counteroffensive, but by its own mercenaries, the Wagner Group, who usually destabilize regimes in faraway countries. The Ukrainian army is currently trying to harness the momentum generated by this instability for its counteroffensive, but it is a complex operation on several fronts. At the same time, there is growing concern that Putin and the Russian army could escalate further while backed into a corner. And there's the unresolved matter of what is to be done with the estimated remaining 25,000. Wagner mercenaries from the uprising. So on to the point we ask, after Prigozhin's revolt, how stricken is Putin's system? A very warm welcome to this week's To The Point. I'm Javier Arguez and I'd like to introduce my guests for today's program. Alexei Yusupov is a Russia expert at Germany's Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Nico Lange is a political consultant and security expert. And Natalia Smolenseva is my colleague from DW's Russian service. To all of you, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for taking the time to try and make sense of all that has happened and is happening. And Alexei, I'd like to start with you. Uh, there's pretty much two versions, depending on who you listen to, about what happened in Russia. One is that Putin successfully stopped an insurrection and consolidated his power. The other one is that Prigozhin uh, actually exposed just how fragile the Putin regime is. What do you make of that? Which one is it? I mean, the more time will pass after the actual events, the more legends and myths, but also conspiracies we're going to hear. So I think it's important to sort and to actually spell out what we've seen. We've seen that it is possible in the core territories of the Russian Federation to seize a military headquarter responsible for the war effort in Ukraine. It's, it's possible to march towards Moscow and it's possible to not bear any visible consequences for it after having killed Russian military servicemen. So to be honest, I don't see how you can frame this. We can see the attempt of the Kremlin and of Vladimir Putin to very actively frame it as a t national test an actual challenge that Russians have overcome altogether. And the absurd thing is that we haven't seen, not even a lot, we haven't seen any actual genuine resistance yes. in favor of the system and the regime. And so Putin's um, attempt to, to, to frame this as a moment of unity is part of the crisis response, clearly. And the crisis actually means that some of the assumptions we've had about the Russian stability are flawed. And definitely there's a lot going on in the background that we probably don't understand right now. But just from a military perspective, how is it even possible to seize control of military headquarters uh, in Russia so quickly as the Wagner Group did? It's possible because the forces for interior security and also the military forces inside of Russia are not present anymore. To me, it was a huge surprise that the headquarters in Rostov, which is the headquarters that controls all of the Russian war against Ukraine, seemed to be totally unprotected. Protected. So Prigozhin came in with his men, Good morning. Uh, we have this under control now. Without any resistance, with any, without any single shot fired, uh, this is from a perspective of security. This is a terrifying perspective. And also then, uh, the, from the border guards to the traffic police or the National Guard uh, enter armed forces in Rostov and in Voronezh, both cities with huge uh, uh, garrisons. Uh, nobody stopped the Wagner Group. This is, I think, a bad sign for the stability of the Russian state. And certainly for a military that is supposed to be so powerful. Now, Natalia, we saw Putin organize what looked like uh, an effort to showcase popular support, but with way less people than we're used to. And in Rostov on Don, we saw people actually cheering the Wagner troops when they came in. How do you explain that? Well, this is a clear demonstration what this public support of Putin's politics and the war actually looks like. These people are just um, passively supporting what's going on, but, you know, when there is... Um when Wagner is marching through the cities, it's easy for them to uh, switch the band and cheer to this other military group. They are just... Uh, they're just looking at what's happening and don't really don't really know who to support in this situation. And if they didn't really march with them, doesn't doesn't mean that they wouldn't in the future when there is more um, more military, more support of that. So I think um, here in the West, everybody, a lot of people are saying, yeah, you know, the majority of Russians are behind this war, behind Putin, behind the regime. I don't think they're behind. They're just they're just uh, waiting to see what happened. And in this clear moment of, as we've now seen, that the system is now, uh, maybe there are cracks more than we've expected, we don't really know how they're going to react. 
And this is a clearer picture of that. It seems like they simply go with the flow, if you will, depending on who comes to their towns. Now, few might have seen an armed insurrection coming in Russia, but conflicts between Yevgeny Prigozhin and the Russian government, especially the military, are nothing new. The revolt set the spotlight on the leader of the Wagner Group more than ever before. This is what a victor actually looks like. Yevgeny Prigozhin after his aborted march on Moscow. While he's been hailed as a hero by some, he's also hated and feared by the army leadership and the Kremlin establishment. Once a favorite of Putin and a key player in the Ukraine war until recently, he has turned against his benefactor. Whether because of his frustration with a lack of support in the war or a calculated power grab, his motivation remains unclear. Prigozhin is calling for a change in army leadership and wants Russia's real motivations for the war to be exposed. According to Prigozhin, it's about recognition and not suspected NATO sabotage. The war was not needed to bring Russian citizens back into our fold, nor to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Experts say this statement is an outrageous provocation that wouldn't be possible without powerful supporters. Is Prigozhin acting on his own, or is he a mere puppet in the power struggle unfolding behind the scenes to secede Vladimir Putin? That's a question many have asked, and I would like to pass it directly on to you, Alex. Is he a puppet? Is he acting on his own? Do we know? Well, the problem with Russian politics for a while is that so much is staged on purpose that people start to actually get lost in what's going on. And I think what Natalia has mentioned is people also in Russia look at this whole thing and say, what is going on? Equally as in the West. Puppet is going too far, I would say. He's definitely an, an intrapreneur. So he is a very, very talented actor who has learned that he can generate loyalty and success by accomplishing special projects. And so his history goes back to the Leningrad and St. Petersburg time of both Vladimir Putin and Evgeny Prigozhin. He started as someone who uh, was in the casino business and he moved on to further financial conglomerates. Then he was tasked with a very important mission to modernize Russian state propaganda and he has created micromedia and telegram channels and so-called troll, fact troll factories. And Wagner was the next big thing for him to manage. He's a manager, he's not a, a field commander. He presents himself as one because he's very talented. He understands that there is a sympathy and there is a need in some parts of the Russian population, including specifically the military part and the nationalist part, to see uh, an earnest war effort. Because things are not sufficient, things are not going well. Everyone knows that things are not going well, and so he feels this niche. So there is agency behind Evgeny Prigozhin, but he's part of the system of Vladimir Putin. He's not an outside actor with his own sui generis power base. And so I think this whole thing was a play for a good deal, for a better deal, or even to elevate himself, Prigozhin, in the ranks of the Putin's elite, and he failed. And after he failed, he realized he needs a way off, and maybe this is what we've witnessed. So it's very interesting to have this perspective of Prigozhin as a businessman. Now, uh, Nico, I would like to uh, ask you if you agree with that perception um, that he is in line with Vladimir Putin, that there's basically no big deal between them right now. Um, do, you, do you agree? Do you see that the same way? I think for some time now, nobody can be really sure with Putin anymore. His closest friends from former times do not have the access. Nobody seems to really know what he's thinking. And if you see the pictures of the Security Council sitting, it doesn't look like these are people working closely together for 10 or 20 years or more. Every, everybody is very distant from Putin. And maybe this is also part of Putin's power game to keep everybody a little bit in limbo and nobody can be really secure in his position. But certainly many people thought Prigozhin has a kind of cover from Putin, at least for a long time. And he was an important instrument in Russia's war against Ukraine. And this instrument is not available now anymore. We will see what this does to uh, Russian's war effort. But I think most of all it was important that Prigozhin, as a former ally of Putin, clearly said, Putin's reason for the war was a lie. It's all wrong. And it's, I mean, we knew that, but if it's coming from somebody like Prigozhin, I think that makes a big difference. And he also made clear that the Russian state is by far not as stable uh, as it looked like, especially to us. And also, by the way, to the Chinese, who seemed also be very shocked with what is going on. And uh, uh, we have seen that uh, 
Putin's personal power is by far not as consolidated as many people believe, inside Russia and also outside Russia. This creates now a situation where we cannot really predict what is happening next. And it seems to me that events are unfolding now, uh, day by day. Uh, uh, now there is talk about uh, General, General Surovikin. But uh, maybe one point uh, that we saw during all of this, uh, Minister of Defense Shoigu, who is criticized a lot because he, his war effort is not going well, uh, because uh, he is not really uh, a military mastermind, seems to be 100% loyal. He has one no, more... not even a professional military man. So yes, but he has one more medal now. Because he is 100% loyal, this has been his reputation since the Yeltsin times. So it seems to be the case that loyalty is more important than competence now, which might be good news for Ukraine. We definitely will have to talk about what's uh, next for Ukraine now. Natalia, I would like to just dwell on the point uh, of Prigozhin actually saying or uh, contradicting the very necessity of this war, which has been the narrative of the Kremlin. What impact do you think that has uh, when you hear Prigozhin saying this was not needed mm. to save the Russians and Russia. I think this is actually one of the most interesting points in everything that happened, because that undermined the whole logic of why did Prigozhin do this? Because if he only did it to like gain some benefits and then come back to the battlefield, or maybe as somebody would say, replace Shoigu there or uh, replace Gerasimov, then why would he undermine the whole logic of this war? This doesn't really make any sense. So we, it still remains to be seen what his gamble was. But I think he was just um, acting probably out of uh, out of fear for his life or for the future of Chevaka Wagner. And that's why his actions cannot be logically explained. But I think this is uh, this is this is words coming from Prigozhin, from a man who's been fighting there on the front lines, that he doesn't see the reason or the necessity for this war. This can resonate with a lot in the elites, a lot of people who think the same, but are not brave enough to say this, and maybe it can give them some ideas um, how to challenge this. So those who are uh, against the war actually found a voice there. Now, instead of a punishment or a death sentence, Putin had surprisingly soft words for the very same soldiers he had called traitors just the day before. I thank those soldiers and commanders of the Wagner Group who made the only right decision. They did not go into fratricidal bloodshed. They stopped at the last line. Today you have the opportunity to continue serving Russia by entering into a contract with the Ministry of Defense or other law enforcement agencies, or to return to your family and friends. Anyone who wants to can go to Belarus. I will keep my promise. And that is something that kept a lot of people and a lot of experts guessing. And of course, we do not know what's going to happen with the mercenaries and with Prigozhin himself. Uh, Nico, when we talk about integrating all those troops into the Russian military, just from a very practical perspective, is it easy to do? No. And to be honest, I think this is far from over. Just because Putin declared there are three options now for them doesn't mean that they will go this way. They are returned to their base, but they still have the weapons, the ammunition, the material. Everybody will think for themselves what's best for them. But we are talking about soldiers that have been removed from the armed forces before and then found a home in Wagner Group. We are talking about fighters that have been fighting criminal wars all over the world that are responsible for crimes against humanity in outrageous uh, dimensions. Uh, so I'm not sure if they have family and friends who want them back home. We are talking about people that were recruited out of pri prison. And that, I mean, that speaks against the alleged uh, strategic genius of Vladimir Putin to have people out of prison, recruited for a brutal uh, troop like uh, Wagner Group, and now he has the problem uh, of them being with weapons in the country. If they will go to Belarus, I am unsure, because it's not clear what will be the business model, or will the business model be taken over by somebody else. I mean, those, this, this group is up for hire. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are also others in Russia who have an interest of making the money that Prigozhin made so far. So the, all those questions, I think, is we only will understand the answers over a period of time. But for the armed forces of Russia themselves, to have brutal people like the Wagner Group, who have been fighting not according to rules that you have in a normal army, who have uh, their own understanding of uh, discipline and order, 
I mean, they kill traitors with a hammer. So integrating them into the armed forces, it's more of a problem than really uh, creating additional battle value. So I think the commanders of the Russian armed forces, especially Shoigu, Gerasimov and the top brass, they will try to formally integrate them, but keep them out of sensitive areas because I think they see a problem in that. However, from the perspective of the mere message that Putin is trying to send, Alex, it does sound quite simple. You know, everything's over, you can either go there or you can be integrated into our forces and it's over. Do you think this was a logic step? Do you think uh, Putin even have a choice uh, to, 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 but to do this? Well, look, the deal was announced uh, by Alexander Lukashenko and these parameters were also given to the audiences later on. And so Putin coming to the camera and actually spelling it out, saying it himself, for me is a little bit also a guarantee to the recipients of the message that this is actually a real way out because it's extra legal. Everything about these events is extra legal. There are no repercussions for those who killed mil uh, Russian military servicemen in the six helicopters and the one uh, reconnaissance and planning plane they shot down. There have been people killed on the ground also. There is nothing, legally speaking, as a consequence. It's a deal. Prigozhin pays, apparently, the families of those pilots and soldiers out of from his own pocket. It's blood money. So it's a coexistence of this um, world of personal deals between Putin and the members of his elite, and, and the other world is the, the world of the Russian state institutions. And now they've collided. And one of the reasons for me that we haven't seen so much resistance is that in so many, many um, bureaucratic uh, um, organizations, people thought, this is, this is an internal fight. So it's, we are not even let them fight it out. Uh, and so the deal, I think, is part of this, part of the messaging. Um, it, for me, it is for me, a Putin has completed a series of public statements now in a very short time, all of them even intensifying the narrative that this was sh something short of a civil war, mm -hmm. that this was a, a, national, a national challenge, and then unity is the answer. And so you can see even this deal and to play it down and to say, look, this is not an issue, actually. You can go to Belarus, you could go to the home, you could go to the armed forces. It's downplaying the actual problem and at the same time exaggerating the event of cri the amount of crisis management that the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin have successfully completed. This seems to be the strategy, and I, 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 I can bet that in the future we'll see he will travel around the country, he will meet with the Orthodox Church, he will maybe even go to the front lines. What we are seeing now is his last electoral campaign kicking off. He's supposed to be elected next year, and everyone thought that's not going to be a big deal because, you know, elections. But at the current moment, you can just not do it without any alterations. He needs to renew his image as a guarantor of internal stability and elite consensus because it's in question. So we're going to see a lot of more of this messaging. We certainly will. Uh, the other big question, and which also depends on that, is what's going to happen with the war in Ukraine. Whoever joins the Russian military knows the likelihood of ending up in Ukraine is greater than ever. On the other side of the border, Ukraine is trying to take advantage of the domestic distraction of the enemy and move forward with its counteroffensive. Pictures from the front near Zaporizhia. Here, the war is very close and any mistake could be fatal. The Ukrainian army is poking tiny holes in the Russian army as they use the momentum caused by the Wagner coup to regain terrain on several sections of the front. However, Russian aerial supremacy is causing problems for Ukrainian soldiers. The Russian helicopters and Russian jets uh, fire every, every, uh, every day, every time. Go to shelters. Okay. So good luck. Something just as important for the Ukrainian army, however, is the battle in depth, far behind enemy lines. This includes attacks on transport hubs, like the recent incursion on the Crimean Bridge, as well as ammunition depots and command posts. These are also part of the counteroffensive. The Ukrainian president knows about the pressure his soldiers face to succeed in this counteroffensive. Can the Ukrainian army take advantage of the short-term instability on the Russian side? I'd like to ask that question to you, Natalia. Is Ukraine in a better position? Does the enemy have any weaknesses right now or did nothing really change? Well, I think there was a big hope in Kyiv when they were looking at what was happening in Rostov and in Moscow. But 
well, I'm not a military analyst, but I don't think there have been there have been a lot of momentum there because the forces that were fighting on the front line didn't go back to defend Moscow from Prigozhin or anything. There was not a big movement of troops, apart from this, uh, of Prigozhin's troops. So I don't think there has been a change. But certainly what did uh, change is the perception of uh, Russian regime, Putin's regime, as something solid, as something that will be there long term and forever. And I think this is a good signal good news both for Kyiv but also for the West because it helps you know Ukrainians uh, with their with their message that you know give us weapons and the regime in the Kremlin would, would crumble it's already crumbling so this is now the moment to actually support us even more good news for Ukraine and for the West but there's also fear Nico that uh, Russia might attack even more intensively now as a result of this to keep up that image what do you think of that I wouldn't worry about that I think it's a myth uh, especially the German debate, uh, all, all the time to make the argument, oh, if something happens, then there will be escalation. I think Putin's problem is he has no instruments to escalate. He's trying everything he can, but he's not achieving his military goals in Ukraine. And he has to be afraid to lose ground now in Ukraine because the Ukrainian counter-offensive might be slow, but it's methodical and it's preparing for greater breakthroughs. Putin uh, uh, has, I think, already at the moment a strategic defense position where he considers it an achievement if he can keep the lines more or less where they are now. So I wouldn't worry much about escalation. What I would worry is the systemic support from partners of Ukraine, including Germany and other Western countries, because we are now at a point in time, because of the long war, where we need more industrial support, more production output in ammunition, in spare parts, in equipment, and to production directly shipped to Ukraine so that Ukraine can keep up the systematic, methodical uh, approach to this counteroffensive. I think if we could fix that now and uh, uh, have understood that if Putin comes under pressure, then he will fold. We have seen that. Prigozhin did that. Uh, uh, then I think there's a good chance to for Ukraine to uh, uh, move forward, but it will not be a quick ending to the war. And I think also the instability will not contribute to the Russian front breaking down. So the methodical approach has to continue, but the chances for Ukraine are quite good. Now, the Wagner Group, Alex, was not officially involved in the war um, anymore, even before this whole thing happened. But what do you think does it mean for the Ukrainian war to have Prigozhin in Belarus, to have potentially mercenaries in Belarus as well? Do you see any impact of that? Well, first of all, we need to wait if Prigozhin is actually going to stay in Belarus. This is his exit door, but he can go further on. He might join some other theaters of Wagner operations uh, in third countries. But he might also just you know, disappear from the visible sphere. So I wouldn't be too worried about him. With Wagner, let's see. There might be rebranding. We have to see how many people actually take the deal. Because the deal is not for the whole group. The deal is for every individual member of Wagner. So let's see about that. I see, however, a much better chance for Ukraine to overstretch uh, the Russian military because one of the takeaways from Putin's sides, obviously, is to strengthen the Russian Guard, the National Guard, to give them actually heavy weaponry in order to prevent a future scenario because now, even if they would have be willing to go in front of Wagner and to stop them, they, they are not the guys with heavy machinery and with heavy equipment. It's all on the front. So if you want to strengthen your National Guard for inner security, for domestic security, you need to take it from somewhere. And wherever you're taking it from, be it the front of the strategic reserve of the Russian military, it's good for the Ukrainian war effort. So this immediate effect is definitely going to be there. We don't have too much time left, but we do have time for a brief conclusion. I would like to uh, go to the beginning of the show, Natalia, and ask you, how stricken is Putin's system from your perspective then? Well, I think this little instance actually shows that this is not as, as solid as we thought. And I think what we here in the West have to be thinking about what comes after Putin and whether we're prepared here politically, but also like who is going to come next and what is the Russian opposition doing there. I think it's very interesting to see how different opposition leaders reacted to the situation, whether they were kind of uh, supporting Prigozhin or like cheering for this, his efforts, or they were just sitting and waiting and didn't really post anything. So I think that's this kind of strategic planning has been lacking because nobody was actually thinking that this regime can crumble so easily. Do you think there is a before and after, Alex? Uh, we are in a new world. We're in a world where Russia doesn't have the time. They thought that their long-term strategy is going to be just to sit it out and wait because Ukraine's going to collapse, the population is tired, the Europeans are either 
a little bit pacifistic or maybe not willing to pay for it, the Americans have an election, we can just sit out and wait. This strategy is over. So we are in a completely new phase of this war. A very brief intervention from you. A few seconds left. How strict is Putin's system? Uh, totalitarian systems are stable until they are not. A, P a Russia without Putin is possible and we should not be afraid of that. That were the words of Nico Lange. Thank you also to Natalia and Alex. And of course, to you for watching. Remember, you can always watch our shows on our YouTube channel and comment on this week's and all of our shows. I'm Javier Arguedas. Until next time, take care and goodbye.